We're yeah. opening up to a new time, European good. friendly. So for all the... I wasn't sure if you'd be awake yet, but this is good. <laughs> Dude, I'm up at 4.30 every morning. I believe that. I believe that. Yeah, so uh, cool. Wow, people are rolling through here. This is great. We're going to give everyone a minute or two to come through. We got a nice, uh, nice set of agenda topics and a good way to get it started. So I'm looking forward to that. So is this different than what you do on at your nightly show or you move this? So this is in addition to the nightly show. So we did the nightly show on Tuesday. Um, the nightly show is a lot more Q and a oriented. Um, and so I think this one will be a lot more, uh, you and I jamming on some, some topics. Um, I think there's gonna be a lot of people here. Last time we did one like this at this time, it felt like we were rushing through the agenda in order to get to yeah. the questions. And so instead of doing that, we'll, um, we'll cover all the agenda in a lot of detail. And then if we do have time for questions, we'll, we'll grab some, but yeah, no let's, promises. I, I, I got, I got a little, I can go over a little bit. So, um, cool. We can, we, we don't have to turn off right at two. I will plan accordingly. All right, Angela, I'm going to let you control this because people are rolling in here fast. Yep, I got it. And I am going to the midday kombucha. Yes, it's right here. Whoever made that comment keeps you going. It's like better than coffee. Um, all right, yeah, little uh, little health aid kombucha. Shout out. Cool. So let's uh, let's get into this. First off, it's great to have everyone here. It's great to have Dave here. I'm really happy that he was able to join us. I love his perspective. Um, he's clearly knows what's going on in terms of how things in marketing, especially in B2B marketing are changing. He uh, has been introducing a lot of concepts from B2C marketing into B2B, which I believe in a lot. And I've been doing that for a long time. We are very aligned on some topics and I'm actually quite surprised that we haven't done something like this yet, but I'm thrilled to, uh, to be able to, to do this now. Um, and so where I want to kind of kick this off, and we have the agenda topics, but I think there's one to just kind of like center it in the ground, which is that I'm going through whether it's with, with prospects or the companies we work with or, or during conversations or talking to people through Q&As and different things like that. I'm, seeing, I'm getting exposed a lot to what's happening in 2021 planning. Most of that is done by now. But the one thing that I consistently saw across companies, specifically B2B, most likely mid-market and enterprise, not a lot of like SMB transactional models, but in B2B mid-market enterprise, sales contribution to revenue and SQOs is relatively flat. It's essentially flat in their planning through the year from year over year. And marketing's contribution to SQO and revenue is 2X. And so marketing is being asked to deliver more than they ever have before. And my belief is that the existing playbook that's been recycled over the last decade is not going to be able to get us there. And so my hope is that we can share a couple of ideas, um, a couple of thoughts that might help, uh, help you all kind of adjust your plan and hopefully help you find something new to, uh, to help you hit your goals. And so that's where, that's where I'll start this one. And so Dave, the first one, and we kind of went back and forth on this for a minute, is interesting about the idea of time. Right. And so I'm getting into these 2021 planning where the revenue ramp happens in month one and they haven't changed anything about their strategy and they don't really have anything figured out. And you had mentioned it takes a long time to get stuff going. And so when you think about executing for your uh, the businesses that you work for, like what's your what's your concept of time first off? And then how do you think about what are you tracking to know whether or not you're in the right direction? Right. Like, especially when we think about more organic, not direct response, not a lot of like, you know, lead gen type of stuff, like a lot more brand marketing, like you and I do a lot. Um, like, what do you think about that? How do you think about well, that? So it's hard. Like, and I, I listened to your, I listened to one of your, how's my audio level, by the way? Is awesome. Okay? Cool. Um, Fantastic. Great, 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 great. Um, I, I, I actually was listening to your, your latest podcast and, uh, Somebody said, and I just wanted to mention this before I forget it. Like somebody, you met, you said like being a marketing leader at a Series A, you know, venture back startup is like the hardest fucking job in the world, <laughs> and it and it is. And so like everybody on here, just like shout out to you because like ugh, it's stressful. Like it's hard. It's because you got to continue to grow, and it's like there's so many external factors that like that hmm. that can happen. And and also Chris, I think the other thing that's that's worth mentioning is like, um. 
oftentimes like it is easier. The reason people do things that we don't like, or you, I've heard you talk about that don't convert is because sometimes there's some level of like, I want to keep my job. And I know this might not be the right thing, but it makes the boss happy and the CEO happy. And so I'm going to go do another ebook thing, you know? And it's like, it's this balance between like, how much do I want to mess stuff up? I mean, the number one question that I see in my, in my, in DGMG, my group, which is like, how do I make change within the organization? Because like, am I going to be the one to tell the CMO that she's crazy? Like, I don't know. And it's like, and, 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 I've, and you, you have the same opinion, which is I, which I do, which is like, I say life is too short to work for a CEO who doesn't get marketing. And I just think like, especially today, there's so many good marketing jobs out there because of COVID, because of how much things have gone remote, you can find a, a, a different job. Anyway, when it when it comes to planning, it, it's hard, um, you, because you have to balance like marketing is a is a game of just portfolio management, right? And you have to balance the short term and the and the long term. But I think like as important as it is to hit the goals every month, I think even before that, what I've learned now is like you have to know what drives those goals. And so even if you're going to miss, like some of the best conversations I've had as a marketer has been with a CEO that said, look we're going to miss this quarter. We're going to miss this month. However, that SEO bet that we made six months is really starting to crank. And so like, I see some really promising signs for, for Q2, Q, whenever. Right. And I think mm -hmm. it's not, to me, it's not always about having the short term, like in month solution. It's about having a path to getting there and showing that you have the levers. And so like, I'm okay walking into a meeting, missing a goal only if I know that we have a plan to correct it. Like, mm -hmm. and so it's one thing to be in like, Hey, we're going to miss. It's another thing to be like, Hey, look, we're going to miss. It sucks. I wish that we made this SEO investment 12 months ago, but we didn't. And this is the reality of it. And so here's the plan. And so we expect this to contribute. And here are some of the, you still have to, you still have to think in this, in, in the mind of the CEO and the board and the company, which is like, you do still have to think short term sometimes. And so you mm -hmm. have to be able to say, look, here's the long-term plan. This is where we want to get to. We want to get to this model, but in the interim, we're going to, we're do, we're running these one or two short-term campaigns so we can help get there. It's like, you're never going to have the perfect answer, but it's always about making progress and continuing to solve the problem. And, 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 and what sometimes happens is, you know, you, if you're married to that problem, like sometimes you have to, you have to go change jobs <laughs> and, and, and then the new person comes in and they, you know, they get to pitch it a whole new way. But it's tough. The, the hardest part is balancing short term and long term. Yeah. And I think the challenge you'd mentioned, like the series A type of startup, that there's a couple challenges. One, oftentimes those CEOs don't get marketing. Two, they haven't scraped their knees in marketing to understand how difficult it actually is. There's like an unrealistic feeling about how you're just going to flip a switch and marketing's going to work. Um, the windows of time that they look in are so short, um, which kind of gets me to to the next question, which is, some of these things you need a long time to figure out, right? Like if your LinkedIn did not just, you didn't just turn that on and have the type of engagement and following that you did. Neither did oh, I. No, no. I, yes, I did. Yes, I did. I did. And now, and now it's, now it's not fair and all that other bullshit that people excuses people like, like once you, you don't get credit for having put in the work for the, for five, six, however many years it takes to show up consistently. They just, mm -hmm. That once you once you get there, that you know they don't they like they don't like to tell that story. So just be care of that yeah. whoever's showing the Ver, whoever's showing the Vero Beach weather that is not nice of you. Appreciate and so, that. And so companies don't uh, don't create the space for those types of things to work, right? Like I've been in these companies before. Right. It's been two months into a long form video podcast, and we're gonna pull the plug because we don't have enough leads. Like okay, well, this is what we gotta talk about. Yeah, so, yeah. I think you can't. Everybody has this, you can't just make a marketing plan in a vacuum. You need guardrails. Like mm. guardrails are the most important thing to making decisions as a marketing team. And so like, here, here's an example. And, and I, and um, I, I've, I've had great relationships in my last two companies at Privy right now and Drift uh, before this with the CEO directly. Mm -hmm. And one thing we've had, a, we've had a very strong alignment on is guardrails. And what that means is what are some of the principles that you have as a company on how you want to do marketing? Mm. And so, for example, at Drift, it was like, hey, we're building this category of conversational marketing. So therefore, we can't do gated content. We can't do this. We can't do that. And that made my life so much easier because at least then I like we've taken some decisions off of the table for like how we're going to operate. Right. Another example is right now at Privy, our focus is on small e-commerce brands. And we want to lead with our education. We want to be friendly and, and, and keep it simple and lead with coaching. So like, 
because we have those guidelines as an organization, we can then make decisions on the types of marketing that we can do, right? That's one part of guardrails. Another part is like the horizon of the company. When I would join Drift as the first marketing person, they had raised $15 million and had you know, 20 years of runway in the bank because they had, they were given a long, you know, a long runway from VCs who were like, Hey, you, you guys are proven. You've done this before. We want to slow, we want to let you build this company the right way. And so as a marketer, I wasn't pressured to do short term things because it was mm -hmm. always like from the beginning, we're building a billion dollar company. We're building a billion dollar company. I think the hardest part for marketers is when you're in that in between stage, right? When you don't know. And so if you join a very, a well backed, startup, right? Uh, if you join like, like a gong right now who just raised $200 million, right? They can make short-term and long-term decisions because they know the cash, the cash position and the whole company is aligned around those things. It's much harder to be in a position where this is a bootstrap business. We need to be profitable. We need to be, you know, in the black by next month. Well, then no kidding. My, my go-to channel would not be SEO, right? It would not be content marketing. And so like, or it'd be content just in a different form. And so mm -hmm. I think like that's such a, that's such an important lens that, that just doesn't like, we don't talk about it enough. And so for me as a marketer, anytime I'm doing anything, my very first conversation is like, what are the guardrails for this? Hey, we're doing our first event. Okay, great. What are the guardrails? Well, we don't want it to be, feel like a shitty, like everybody else's event. We want it to be here. Uh, we want it, we need it to cost this much. It's, it's the same type of thing, but it's making, having guardrails for how you make decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think Early on at Drift, one of the best things that we did was we wrote our market. We wrote like a marketing manifesto, which is like, here's here's our beliefs on marketing and how we do marketing as a team. And that was great because it, it gave us like guiding principles for how we do what we do. And it also helped from a coaching standpoint, because it's like, well, the reason that we want to write copy this way is because this is the brand that we want to be and blah, blah, blah. Love that. Everyone listening that's, that might be struggling, and I've struggled with this before, I still do with some of our customers. And so there are some really interesting things to take away from that in terms of a framework to get alignment before you actually go and execute. Now that we set the stage, let's get to the promised agenda. And I don't even know which topic I'm going to pick yet, but this is going to be a blast. And so um, let's, uh, I, I know that we're not, I don't want to take up the whole time here, but I know this is a hot topic and I re really want people to, to figure this out and also hear your perspective on it. Cause I think it's going to help a lot of people. Cause I know a ton of people struggle with the, the concept of attribution, right? Especially when you think about, um, like LinkedIn organic content or doing a podcast, a lot of companies don't do that cause they don't have attribution, um, paid social or things like that get run like Google AdWords because you need direct attribution. And so just wanted to hear from, from your perspective, like maybe a drift would be a good way. Like, how did you, how did you look at that? Um, what was the, what was the thinking inside of the company, maybe at the, at DC's level. And so we'd love to hear that, hear yeah. about that. Well, so first, like we had, like I had the, ult, the utmost alignment, I think to, at least in my experience, the more questions you get about attribution from people that are not in marketing means the more people don't believe in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so here's a, here's an example. Early days at Drift, one of the first marketing channels, one of the first channels that we launched was our was this podcast called Seeking Wisdom, and David still does it today. It's great. Um, and when we launched the show, a couple weeks in, the feedback to it was like, I had never gotten so many DMs and messages on Twitter, and like it wasn't that many. It was like four. But if you go from none to like four people tweeted at you about your podcast in a week, you're like, oh shit. And so, so in stage one, it's just a gut feeling like attribution mm -hmm. in the beginning is just a gut feeling like, huh, I can now tweet something. And if I tweet something and people disagree with it, they tell me, right? So like, <laughs> oh, gut feeling, there's people there, right? Mm -hmm. It starts with the gut feeling. But what happened was through the podcast, and I, you've talked about this with podcasting and other content, but like we created this connection with listeners in, in a way that was not like any other marketing channel, people literally walking around listening to you in their ears. We, we had an office in uh, the Copley Mall in, in Boston at the time. And, and it was like, it's just like high-end mall. There's fancy stores and lunch places and whatever. And, and DC and I would be going for a walk. Like we walk two, three times a day, get a coffee, whatever. And people would literally walk by us and they go, DC, DG, like, that's a joke. We, we're a B2B software company. We're not the, we're not anybody cool or fame, like, or real or famous. And like, that was when it was like, wait a second, this is, there's something different here. And so we, it, it, it turned into this thing where we would joke 
we would now see, then we'd see like somebody post on LinkedIn, be like, oh my gosh, if you're not listening to this podcast, you got to go. And it'd be like some, mm-hmm. you know, director of marketing at Adobe. And it's like, Phew. and so we would take a screenshot of that and it became a joke. He would send it to me and be like, Dave, how are we ever going to measure the podcast? And so attribution on the brand channels is like V1 is a feeling V2 over time. And I've seen this just now at Privy, we've grown a direct traffic 50% in a year. And that is solely because of a reinvestment in brand. We, we tripled c- production on the blog. We launched a podcast. We did uh, virtual events like that. That's, there, are measure, there are ways to measure the, the brand stuff that you're doing. And so saw the same thing at Drift, early days of Drift, like 90% of our inbound of our lead gen was inbound. Like I heard about Drift. I would like to talk to somebody. And like mm-hmm. the first 20 to 30 reps at Drift were like shooting fish in a barrel from a closing deals perspective because they were inbound high intent had seen had heard and so like you know as you scale there's 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 other there's real attribution ways but i think so often with the brand channels like when you have them they you just you know it and you can also look at are you growing direct traffic are you growing organic traffic are more people finding you right like you mentioned this on your on your podcast you used to have no meetings Now you have up, now your pipeline is full. Like if I probably wanted to hire you, I probably couldn't right now. (laughs) So, Hey, Chris, has content been working for you? Yes. Like there Mm -hmm. is some correlation effect of like, yeah, you made an investment the last year and a half, two years to go nuts on LinkedIn and, and provide, you have something to say and, and do a good job with video content and post social, right? Now your pipeline is full. There's not one direct response channel. I think you know, and, and this isn't rocket science, but it comes down to being aligned with a, with a company and a CEO and a boss and a manager who believe that, right? I was never, I was never under any pressure to try to quantify the podcast. Like we had to quantify other channels. Hey, we're spending on content. We're spending on events. We're spending on advertising. You know, let's, let's really try to quantify the dollars on that. But like, I never had to be in a position where I had to, you know, try to be like, well, yeah, no, we can do a podcast that generate, generates leads and downloads. It didn't mm-hmm. have to work like that. Yeah. And when you're in organic awareness channels, podcast, organic social, whether that's LinkedIn or it could be Instagram for other people or whichever channel you choose, the, the first piece you mentioned, it was gut feeling. I, I call it qualitative. It's qualitative feeling. You need to be in there and see it. You need to see that that one CMO made a comment or tweeted you or did something. Totally. I also think it's like, it's a key skill of content marketing, right? Like, because to be good at content, you have to have a gut feel. You have to have a sense of like, and I bet, I bet you have this now, Chris, like you probably know your audience now at a level where you're like, when you're posting a LinkedIn video, you're like, oh, I know this one's going to get them all riled up. Right. And like, that's the game with content marketing is like to know your audience to know what types of content they want, right? Like Mm. Gong does a good example of this. The reason they're good at content is because they, they, they know their, they know their customer and they know what type of content that person wants. There's not always a perfect, perfectly attributed, you know, Google analytics funnel. That's going to tell you that path. But when Mm -hmm. you have a sense for what your audience wants, it's such a game of like matching content to, to, to them. And you, and you do that by publishing, like you have to get out there and actually put your stuff out there every week every day, every month. And I think uh, the people who don't see the, the attribution on, on brand content like that, it's, to, it's usually because what you said, you do it for two weeks and you haven't generated a million dollars in pipeline. And so the other helpful mindset has been like, how can you think about how you split your time? Can I make sure that 70% of, or, or whatever, 60% of what we're doing is, is, is focused on short term? And can I make sure that 40%? And so like, whether that's looking at your budget, looking at your marketing plan, or just taking 10 minutes after this session today, go on the whiteboard and draw out all the initiatives that your team is working on. How many of those are short-term focused? How many of those are long-term focused? And like, what needs to be balanced? Because there needs to be, there needs to be a balance, right? Mm -hmm. I heard one, one word in there that you said, that's a hot topic that also matches on the agenda, which was intent. And so I think that there's a lot of confusion in the market about intent. And so would love to, because we have intent data, we have, high intent lead that comes to Drift's website and says, Hey, I want to talk to your sales rep. Those two levels of intent are dramatically different. Right. And then you have like something like someone that attended this webinar, I would consider whether they want to buy privy or work with us as incredibly low intent. Right. And so, um, yeah. how do you, how do you think about it? Are you, have you used it before? Like, yeah. How do you think about it? Yeah. So I've, 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 I've been around it in, in levels. I, I, I used to work with a guy named Guillaume Caban, who's a, a like 
super technical growth guy. And he's more of the like intent data signals from other platforms, you know, crazy stuff. I, my, my thinking on intent is as a, as, as more of a classical marketer in that sense of like, look, you're, if you're on this webinar right now and, and we email you after that's like, Hey, thanks for attending the, the session with Dave and Chris, here's a 20% off deal to buy privy. You're going to be like, what? <laughs> Right. But if this session was like how to use privy on your Shopify store and, and like, and then we followed up with you, there might actually be some, some intent because of the, the, the topic. And so I think like in marketing, yes, there's a whole intent and I'm, and I'm not the technical marketer that that's more like your wheelhouse. Right. But like, there's a whole level of like, what type of intent signals can you get from other channels? But I think of it as like, well, what are this almost, it's almost like stages of awareness and, and, and stages of your funnel. And so if this is somebody that's typing in Google, you know, how to, how to set up, how to set up privy on e-commerce store, that's much more lower of the funnel, higher intent content than our podcast, which is listen to e-commerce marketing school. And so I think like you have to, you have to understand uh, what one helpful exercise is take all of your lead sources and just create another column next to it that looks at the close rate. Right. And, and very quickly, you're going to see that there's one or two channels that close at about 30 to 40%. Those are going to be no surprise. What the inbound demos, right? Maybe some, some things that come through chat and then all the other channels are going to be like 2% content, 1% webinars. And like you, you need the mix because the, the content is not just for, for lead gen, but the challenge becomes like, how do you grow intent? And I think that the latest thing I've been thinking a lot about is like the way that you grow intent today in a world where most B2B buying is done because of word of mouth. I, I talked to lot. Chris, I talked to Chris, who's the VP of marketing at some company. That's my buddy. He says, don't use this product or don't use this guy's agency. They're trash. So I'm not going to, I'm going to do my own research. I'm going to read your blog. I'm going to listen to your podcast, but I'm going to also gut check it with somebody. Oh, or why, why does my competitor use that on their website? And I'm going to go check it out and get a demo. And so I think like, I think today, the, as a mo modern marketer today, I think the best way to increase intent is to position your brand as the expert for your topic. And so if you're selling conversational marketing or e-commerce marketing software or medical devices or whatever, the best, the single best strategy in B2B marketing is to be the expert on that topic. And like the way you increase intent is by being the media company that is creating content for that niche. And you have everything. You have the top of the funnel stuff, but you also have the, the how-to guides, the, the, the examples, the tactical, the, the case studies. There isn't some magic like technical change that you're going to make. It's like, no, if you be the leader, be the expert, and then have every piece of content online that people would need to buy. So you got a podcast, you're on YouTube, you got, you know, you got a, great, a strong presence on review sites, you do stuff with influencers. It's like, to me, it continues to be content. That is the hands down best channel in, in, in B2B from, from both a brand building and direct response marketing perspective. Mm -hmm. And the way, the way that I've been thinking about intent recently is just like taking a step back and being like, B2B buyers are smart. You know what I mean? B2B buyers are smart. If they, if they are compelled and have a problem and they want to buy your software, they know where to go. They know what to do, right? When they're ready to buy. And so... I think that I would say, this... I would say I've, I've bought a lot of B2B. Like if you run marketing at a SaaS company and have a VC, like you, you I, we have a lot of bought a lot of stuff. 99% of the stuff that I've bought, I've either used it before. Or somebody I know that has told me about it. Period. That's it. <laughs> I thought there was going to be one more, but that's pretty much. No, I, I thought there was two. And I was like, no, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be lying. I was just trying to make a nice clean three list of three. Yeah. And I just would have been lying. But like every now and then, I'll get a great cold email that's like, Dave, I saw you host your podcast on this. Is there any reason you don't use this? Because companies like this are doing this. And, and I'm like, shit, that seems legit. And I, okay, I'm going to go look and maybe I'll take, I will very rarely take a demo from cold email. Hell no. Mm -hmm. I will read the email, be like, huh, this company seems interesting. Take a screenshot of it, send it to a, a CMO friend, but then also maybe go to their website and look around and then come back to it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I, the hard part is like, there's not, there's not an easy way to, to measure all of that stuff. And so people have a hard time committing to it. It's like, yeah, yeah, Dave, I, I believe in that, but now tell me how to perfectly instrument it so mm -hmm. I can, you know, show my, my CFO that this is working. And that's the challenge. 
I heard a little bit of a note. It's nice because you're kind of like guiding the agenda through your responses, which is awesome. So you had mentioned be the media company. And I've actually been thinking about this in a little bit of a different way, which is just that being the media company is one taking control of first like own channels in a modern PR format. Like I would consider having a podcast yes. running organic social and maybe having a YouTube show just being a modern form of PR and through the execution of those, you get earned PR when you do it well, you get come, right. A hundred percent. And by the way, wh when you, if you're lucky enough to get tapped for an earned PR interview or whatever, you actually have something to say. You actually have a talk track because you've been like, yeah, like, sure. I could do, I could do an interview on, like for you, right. You've been doing a demand gen podcast for a year now, whatever it is. Bring me to any demand gen event in the world. I, I can talk about it because I've done this. I do a hundred episodes of this. It's like it's easier. The, the the reason like I love the media company thing is because I think that in B two B brand like the the term brand gets like mixed up with with your website or your logo or your colors or like you know sending out swag and books trade right? shows. Yep. And trade shows. And I I think of it to me the way that I think about brand is brand is your reputation. It's like, oh, that that's on brand for him. That's on brand for her, right? Like the way that we talk about that uh, in, in, with, you know, in, in life, or at least my mm -hmm. wife and I do when we look at celebrities or whatever, right? But like that that's on brand for her. And so I think of it as in B2B marketing, like the best way to boost your reputation is content because not everyone's going to get to know you and shake your hand in person and see that you're good or whatever. And so the best way to build your reputation is content. And so you focus on content content is what builds your reputation. You have a stronger, rep stronger reputation. You have a stronger brand. And so mm -hmm. that, that's what the, that's what the media team is focused on. And I think there's a PR component to that, but I think you can become your own publishing company. Like it's, it's silly that you can have a podcast, you can be on Twitter, you can be on LinkedIn 20 years ago. If you started a B2B company, you had to like maybe be Salesforce and say some crazy controversial shit and raise a ton of money. And maybe you'll get press coverage today. I wouldn't even think about press in the early days of a startup. I'd be like, Nope, we're going to go build a media company. We're going to become the X. We're going to have the expert podcast mm -hmm. for financial planning, the Facebook group for financial planning, the Twitter feed for financial planning. And we're going to attract this like mass of, of financial planners as our audience. And then we're going to talk about our product secondarily. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, the term brand has a bad stigma in B2B because for so long it's been used to justify tactics that don't produce results. I just really think that that's sort of what it is. Not that that's, yeah. not that that's how it should be, but I see that how it is. And now the way that I think about brand has a lot more to do with relevance, like the difference between do they know you and do they have an affinity for you? And that gap I think is really large. There's plenty of SaaS companies that I know their brand name whether I have a, a feeling of relevance or affinity to them is a whole different story. And so I think that the media company can unlock that by creating more, for lack of a better way to say it, just more value for people commanding their attention because you're providing good information. Yeah. It's, it's also, I, I haven't had a ton of experience with this, like on the enterprise ABM side, I've just, just done it as like a, a slice, a tiny segment, mm -hmm. but it's like, it's why I get the idea of ABM and, and love the con love the concept of it, right? Because it's like, you don't have to try to analyze everything at the end of the day. Are you getting into these targeted, this, this named list of accounts or not? And so I, I like it from like, from, from that standpoint, because I feel like the challenge is you can do all those brand things that we've mentioned and not be hitting your number from a lead gen or, or meetings or pipeline or whatever. And everyone's going to look at it as like, well, you know, this is not working. But my point is like, that's not the measurement of those things that like the, the, you're not doing, you're not starting a podcast. So you will book meetings. Mm -hmm. You're starting a podcast. So you will build your brand. So more people will know, like, and trust you. So when they're thinking about your pro when they're, when they have that pain or have that problem, they might consider you mm -hmm. like when we launched at drift, we had an audience of six months of email subscribers solely through content. 
And we got to reach out to them and basically say, hey, psst, you know us, the people that you know, the people that you've been listening to for the last six months, we have a product now that actually perfectly fits your needs. Do you want to get a demo of it, right? Like mm -hmm. that's a, a, like a dramatic example of how it works, but that's ultimately the goal. If I wanted to generate leads from content, my strategy would not be do a podcast. I would do like an industry report and gate it. And mm -hmm. that's what you would get. And so yep. you have to know what you're, you have to know the why behind what you're doing also. Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you see as a couple of the biggest misses when companies try and take this leap to media company? They're not good at creating content or they don't have anything interesting to say. Mm. <laughs> like Chris, I'm going to use you as an example. Don't take this the wrong way. Is your I'm video stuff it. the coolest? Is your video stuff like the highest level production in the world? <laughs> Does it look not. like amazing? No, <laughs> you you either, you know, maybe you got somebody on your team. Maybe you're paying somebody 40 bucks on Fiverr. I don't know. Mm -hmm. The reason you've built an audience is because you have something interesting to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you have something interesting to say. You have a very clear point of view on something in an industry that matters to people. And so you're not just, you don't just have a strong opinion about how I should shovel my driveway. Cause it's like, Okay. Right. You're like, <laughs> I have a very strong opinion on how to do copywriting and copywriting is an important thing. And so like most people just get in and go through the motions where like it works best if you're actually passionate about it. And so one thing, one thing that I love is like to use the founder of the B2B brand as the mouthpiece for the brand, because like, you know, you got to be a, some type of crazy person to start a SaaS company and raise money and do all that stuff. And usually there's a reason why. And so like, if I look at Ben, who's the founder of Privy, he has like small business roots. And so of course he builds a business in e-commerce. David Cancel at Drift had spent 20 years building sales and marketing technology. And so they built a new way to do it. Those two people should be the front people of those companies. And you tell mm -hmm. the, you tell it, you tell the brand through that story and they're going to have industry connections and a network or whatever. But even if you don't, let's say you're just Chris in the dorm room, but you love marketing ops and you started a company around marketing ops. There's gotta be an interesting story there. Like, and so I, I think most, the reason most content doesn't work is because it's boring, not because you didn't post on LinkedIn at the right time. Like mm. there's no wrong time to post good content. You got to actually have something to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been looking at it in two ways. One, I think that content falls down due to having the wrong intent as in trying to sell stuff in your content, which then doesn't, people don't want that right? Especially in awareness channels. And the second thing that kind of goes into not having something interesting to say is the lack of a subject matter expert that can be the voice of the content. Because you actually need to be in the details, right? Like, um, I'm sure Ben has a ton of experience with SMB Ecom, which then allows him to be able to speak at that at an authoritative level. And the, the challenge for a lot of companies that I see try and do this is that they have a marketing manager or somebody, nothing wrong with marketing managers, by the way, but somebody that may not have subject matter expertise at the level of the CISO that they're trying to sell to. And that becomes the gap where the content doesn't hit. Yeah. And I think, I think like that's, it's the same mistake where like, how, how do you think, how do you think a 22 year old, this is no disrespect. How, how is a 22 year old BDR going to send a cold email to the CMO of a $2 billion company and try to relate to their pain about some problem. Like it's, it, they don't have the experience. It's, it's different. It's not, it's not, it's not real. It's not authentic. I'm not saying it can't happen, but same thing with content. And so like, again, back to guardrails, if you want to build the media company, you got to think about what your angle is. And so in that case, if it was me, if I don't have the expertise in house, well, shit, I probably shouldn't have joined that company in the first place because it means there's no one that knows that has industry expertise here. Right. <laughs> but, but you can also become a curator and that can be a really interesting strategy, mm -hmm. which is like, what, what if you're not the expert, but you are good at hosting the party? It's like what I'm trying to do now with, with my marketing with DGMG is like, I'm not teaching this, but I know what content people want. And so I'm talking to friends and experts and industry people about what's interesting to them and just becoming a curator. And so I think that that's one way to do it uh, is to use, is to use expertise and like, that's another way of thinking like a, a media company, right? You don't have, you know, you have to go out and do interviews to, to write your stories. You're not mm -hmm. the only person that's coming up with this in, in a vacuum. So we've been going back and forth on this one for a little while. And I'm actually quite surprised that a lot of no MarTech or sales tech vendors have really taken a move on this. I think that those types of buyers would and companies that sell to those buyers would move first 
on something like B2B influencer marketing. And I, to be honest, I think that it needs a different name. I think it has a negative connotation, which is why for part of the reason why B2B companies won't try it. The caveat here is that I know that it needs to be translated and repackaged in order to work in a B2B environment. This is not going yeah. to be the, I'm going to uh, give you 50 bucks for you to post a picture of me using gong on LinkedIn. That's not yeah, how this would. Is. Well, if I could get three MQLs, I would do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you bring up the, uh, the most important part, part of this is that they don't do it because they think about it so transactionally and not at a brand level that they would never do it because they don't see anything tangible out of it. Like, oh, you posted on that. I've had a couple conversations with people about this and they're like, you're not giving me anything. I'm like, really? I just shouted you out on the podcast. I know you got four customers. From that. <laughs> I know. I trust me. Trust me. Somebody from Gong commented on my LinkedIn post that it was like, I'll give you a dollar for each one of these posts. I was like, a dollar? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, Seriously. Well, I think, I think six, to your point, I think to your point about the name, they did. Uh, so, <laughs> so how, I guess like, I haven't, I haven't thought about the naming thing, but I think, I actually think it's, it should be more of an extension of content marketing. Like I think mm. it would be, for me, it should be like same way that we just talked about kind of like modern PR. I think this is a channel in that bucket because to me, an example of in influencer marketing is it's not you posted my thing and we got more things from it. It's like if I sell B2B marketing software, I got the CMO of Salesforce to be the keynote at our breakfast mm -hmm. and she's the draw and she's the reason we get people there. That is influencer marketing, right? You are using totally. somebody else's name and network and exposure to, 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 re to reach, you, you know, whatever. It's like Another example of it is this, you and I messaged before you said, this is the most people you've had si sign up for this thing. And so like people came because maybe they thought they knew, they knew me and you. Right. And so you get more people to show up. If, if, if my next zoom call was me and my mom, like maybe four people would, would show up. And like, <laughs> so I think content is a great way to do the influencer thing. Mm -hmm. I also think like, you have to think about what, what is the, de what would the desired like outcome be? Not from a, MQL standpoint, like, and so I think of it, I think of it a lot as a, from a brand affiliation standpoint, which is like a great marketing play is to say mm -hmm. like, Hey, we had the CMO of Salesforce keynote our breakfast by association. I now think that you're legit, mm -hmm. right? Because you know, you don't have rinky dink, some person I've never heard of, right? Do you have the, how did they, they must be legit. They got the CMO of Salesforce, right? Mm -hmm. I heard a great story. I heard a great story a, a couple of years ago from uh, a CMO, multi-billion dollar company. They had hired president Obama to be, they, they paid him to be a, a speaker, a guest speaker at a, an event. And they went out and he cost, I don't know, he probably cost a, a million dollars, half million bucks, who knows, whatever it is, but they, they could pay it. They went out to their top 250 target accounts. They had 98% response rate mm -hmm. to that event, right? Do you know why? Was it because they picked the right time of day or they used Marketo to send the emails? No, because of the content, because of they had freaking Barack Obama. And so the follow-up there is not, hey, do you want to get a demo because you were on our Zoom with Obama? It's mm -hmm. You give the sales team something. It's about starting conversations. It's about like, I gave you ammo to start a conversation, right? And so, hey, 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 Chris, did you go to the Obama thing last week? Imagine that was no, my email. It. Imagine that yeah. was my follow-up cadence. Like, oh no, I'm like, you're going to get something back. And so I think like those channels to me are about starting conversations. Mm -hmm. um, I also think on the influencer thing, it's hard. It, it would be hard to identify people think it's like harder to, it might be harder to identify those people and they mm -hmm. might look at vanity metrics like followers or whatever. But like, mm -hmm. I think of it from a, it's a, it's a great way to, to boost, to boost credibility. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another example. We wrote a book at Privy this year, e-commerce marketing handbook. It's privy.com slash book. If you look it up, I DM the see uh, I tweeted at the COO of Shopify, Harley. He's now the president. And I was like, oh man, it would make my day if a bunch of people retweeted this because I want Harley to write the intro to our book. We're trying to get in touch with him. A bunch of people retweet it. He's, he's, like, he's like, shoot me a note. He DMs me. He's like, let's do it. Reach out to him. We go through his team. Three months later, the COO of freaking Shopify wrote the intro to our book, right? That, that to me is influencer marketing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you mentioned one as more of a content pillar to drive credibility. And I have a couple other ones that kind of move downstream a little bit. So in 2016, we, I did this right. Like in actually in healthcare, pharma, medical device, it's actually quite common to have a strong physician that uses your product 
and you have them go to a conference to present on how they use it to another thousand people that are just like them, right? And so we arrange those things. And I think that is a very uh, authentic way to do quote unquote influencer marketing in a B2B setting. Find your power user, like ideally, like for ours, they were like Seattle children's, Boston children's, all the top top 25 children's hospitals is the people that we were, we were leveraging for those. So they have credibility and people trust them. And some of them also had like a pretty good Facebook audience at that time, 2015, they have 50,000 Facebook followers that were also respiratory therapists or physicians or things like that. So did you pay you could, them? What, what was the arrangement? So there's, uh, there's legal challenges inside of healthcare things for to because it biases physicians. And so we did it all in a legal way, you, they do get paid, but they get compensated for their time based on a specific rate. And so but yes, we we did, you, you technically have to pay them for that. Um, I would also like if you're interested in this, by the way, like, I think the best thing you could just do is just like pick, just try to do it on your own. Don't make it a big like marketing like thing, mm -hmm. right? Like I'll give you an example. Today, we we heard we we heard that there's somebody on from a privy, this is a little bit different because it's kind of small business e-com, but um, we had heard from the sales team over and over that like people keep hearing about us from some TikTok channel. <laughs> and so we found the person on TikTok who had mentioned us, we found the video, and, and reached out to her and, and we asked her if she would create three videos for a price. And she said, yeah, let's do it. And can I have six months of privy? And so like, now we're talking to her about, about doing something. And so like, I don't know what the output of that is, but it's like, we only, we're only spending like a, a thousand bucks on a little mm -hmm. test. It doesn't have to be this huge plan. Like spend mm -hmm. the thousand bucks, see what happens. Maybe there's a little bit more something there and then be like, oh shit, there's something here. Huh? I wonder how we could make this more of a thing that maybe we could measure. I think also like we too often just like jump right into like, okay, I got to do influencer marketing. How am I going to do it? How am I going to measure it? How am I going to scale it? What if we this gets too many people. demos? Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> just do it and see what happens and be like, holy shit, a ton of people signed up and we don't know where they came from. Maybe it's from that influencer. Like, mm -hmm. I think we're not, we're not okay with like breaking that first. And especially if I know this audience, it's like most people are not at hundred million dollar, $200 million, $500 million company. It's like, if you're at the $6 million SaaS company, it's okay. Nothing's going to break. Like you can go and try that and it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Worst thing that's going to happen is a sales rep's going to get a demo and be like, I don't know where this lead came from. Like mm -hmm. the other two ideas that I've been thinking about, I think there's a definitely a play in user generated content. The sort of like what you just mentioned on the privy side that happened unsolicited, but then you solicited for it. And so it's like, let's say you sell um, like education technology to universities, right? And so your user is the um, IT director of Stanford, let's say, like, how do you get, and they're your power user, how do you get them involved in creating a 10 minute video about how they set it up in their infrastructure so that enrollment happened better than anyone else's. And so figuring out how you can both uh, sort of elevate your users say, hey, you're one of the best users of our product in the country. Can you, would you be open to creating a 25 minute video about how you did this exact thing so that other people could learn from you? And a lot of people would be th thrilled to do that for free. You know what I mean? I totally, think that that I, totally. I think like, it also is just like, well, it's so easy to be like, well, Chris, I can't do user generated content. We sell, we sell SaaS, we sell software. What do you want me to do? Take a picture of me, my, me in front of my computer. And it's like, I think that user generated content can even be, it's a signal for your brand. So like one thing that I love to do is like anytime we have like an event or a webinar or something where there's like a direct response thing, like you su subscribe to our blog, mm -hmm. the kick, the, the email that comes back from that, I always ask people to tweet it out. I always have a PS that's like, PS, it would make my day if you told a couple of friends on Twitter that you just signed up for our event. Mm -hmm. Even if that drives zero signups, let's say 40 people or seven people tweet that, immediately the next day, I will go and grab those tweets, grab the embed code and slap it on the event landing page. <laughs> because mm -hmm. now you've used user generated content. You're signaling to the world, like, oh, you're signaling to the world, like other humans are interested in this. It's like, no one wants to be the person that goes to the restaurant on Yelp that has zero reviews. It's like, eh, Chris, you can go check that one out. I'll go to the mm -hmm. next one. And so like, it's so, it's so easy with social media. It doesn't have to be a picture using your product. It can be, how can you, how can you in first encourage people to share what they're doing with your product uh, online? Like, can you build, you know, that that's also the value of you being out there or whoever as a, as a content, you know, being out in the sphere of content, you actually 
have comments. People post things. I, I use comments on LinkedIn posts and tweets as marketing material all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's massive market research. The main, the main reason I engage in the comments one is because I want to help people, but, but mainly yeah. because it gives you deep insights, right? Like better than using Qualtrics and sending it out to a thousand people. I get insights every day. I, I totally agree. And I can't, I can't always articulate it, but you're smart for putting it that way. Like a hundred percent. I can't, I, sometimes I'm like, I know, I just know what to create. It's not always perfect, but like, I feel like I've talked so freaking much about B2B marketing the last 10 years. I kind of know what to create. Like, I don't, you know, I don't, I, mean, I don't need to go to Ahrefs and like go five pages deep on keyword research all the time, because it's like, you kind of know what people are interested in. And that, that should be the goal for you as a marketer at your company is like mm -hmm. to have that deep understanding of not just your customer, but the market and what's interesting to them. And how can you use content to start conversations that that's, I love that. I love thinking about it that way. Awesome. So for the 251 people that are still here, you all are awesome. We really appreciate you. I'm going to throw this to you, Dave, as kind of an open-ended. We came in here promising some ideas. Like, so we had modern PR, we talked about podcasting, we talked about attribution, we talked about a lot of things that are, I would say, more progressive, more forward thinking. And so are there any other topics that you've, things that you've actually been executing that are working really well that we haven't covered that you think people should try and work into their plan this year? Like what's on your mind there? Oh man, I don't know. There's so, there's not, there's not one particular thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like, there's never one, there's never one channel. I think for me, the biggest takeaway is like, I'm obsessed with the media company thing, but more than being the media company, I think you have to have your topic. And so like, don't take this as like, oh, they talked about media company. We're going to get on clubhouse tomorrow. We're going to start a podcast. Like you need that core message. And mm -hmm. whether that's demand gen or like, what is the, like, maybe put, put your industry, give me, give me an example of an industry right now. Put, put your industry in, in, in chat real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get one. We'll go through someone's example with them. Chatbots, banking, logistics, community, dental. Dental right? will be cool. Solar energy. Dental. There's so many. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> so like every one of these industries, the goal is to, is to be the, be seen as the expert. You don't have to be the first, but you have to have a unique take on mm -hmm. something in that industry. Um, this is insane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so like more than a channel, I'm thinking about like, okay, what do we have to say about manufacturing and like, who are we trying to attract? Mm -hmm. If we started a blog, a podcast, a YouTube channel, a newsletter, what would actually get that person who works in manufacturing to subscribe to our email list? Mm -hmm. Not just to get sales emails from us, but like, I don't know what, what would it be? I think that's the type of like first principles thinking is like, What's what I always try to bias to like, what's interesting to me as a person, like in this market, what, what would I actually, what brands do I actually look forward to getting emails from? What podcast do I listen to that's actually put on by a brand, but I don't, it, it's not promoted by the brand. They just kind of like underwrite it, right? Like you mm -hmm. got to work backwards from there to figure out what type of content to, to create. Right on. Identifying your audience is, is step one, yeah. unique point of view, different, different components like that. Um, and have an opinion on what good looks like, right? Go and find someone that you can copy, like who's doing this well, go and build, you know, go and take Chris's model for refine labs and build that for your industry. Like you got to have someone to pattern this after. No doubt. Cool. Um, I think we're good. Let's go. If you're down, let's go to Q and a for 10 minutes. I'm down. I got All a right. bowl full of berries. <laughs> cool. Q and A, drop them in. Cool. Um, yeah, we have one. Let's see. Um, how can you tell at the interview stage, whether a CEO gets it and Ooh. it is referring to marketing? All you, Dave. You draw them a picture and then together you're going to critique it. No. Um, well, it depends on what role. So if you're interviewing with the CEO, then I would assume that it's at a, lo a level where you're talking about company strategy. And so like, I would ask a lot of questions about like, let's say this is a first marketing hire. Why, why are you hiring marketing would be a question that I ask. And if they're like, well, you know, we got a bunch of trade shows. We got to execute. We're, we're not, you know, we got to execute on that. But if they're like really passionate about brand, I want to create a relationship. I love how HubSpot does marketing and I want to be like HubSpot for us. And okay, like 
have a conversation about like you're in, if that was me, I would be interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing me. And so I'm like, how do you think about marketing? What role does marketing play? It, what role does marketing play in your organization? How, how do you think you'll measure marketing? Uh, you know, what's your vision for what good marketing looks like? And I can think back to my conversation early days at Drift with David Cancel. Two seconds in, we're, we're talking about marketing tools and channels, and he loves the way this company did their event, and I do too, and this company has a podcast, like, instantly. Same thing at Privy with Ben. He's sending me examples of this company. Like, it, it's you got to have that conversation with, you know, about marketing and about the, I would ask about the role of marketing in that organization. Totally. That was a that was an awesome answer. I'm just gonna so I don't have much to add because it was very comprehensive. But I do have one thing is for me, I think an interesting question to ask is what is the, how is the budget the commercial budget divided between marketing and sales. And I think it really tells you how that company prior does how they think about marketing just based on how the budget is split. Um, yeah, that, that's a good one. Or like, or even you could ask like, even even if you didn't ask budget, you could say like, how much is marketing count. contribute? How much is sales contribute? Mm hmm. Yeah, because so, if it's 70 percent sales, thirty percent marketing, eighty percent sales, thirty twenty percent marketing, you already know what type of marketing work. Where like if you meet a CEO and, and they're like, oh, if, if the CEO's she's like, oh, we want to shift to like product product like growth. Like I would love to have marketing contribute eighty percent. Then I'd be like, okay, let's do tell that. me more. Let's do that. Okay. Right on. Cool. Next one, Angelica. Let's do this. Nice. Um, can Chris or Dave give a perspective of where SDR teams typically misalign with marketing and how to solve for this proactively? You go Any first. Any thoughts? You want me to go first? So uh, the, sh the short answer is I've been in multiple companies that have SDRs and those comp every company they've been under sales. I recognize that some companies are moving that under marketing, which might create a little bit more alignment. But what I see when companies move SDRs into marketing is they don't actually change anything fundamentally about S what SDRs do. They're just, it's an org chart shift. Um, and so a couple, I'm not sure I'm gonna answer the question directly because I'm just sharing my thoughts here. The, the, the thing that I'm most focused on is the idea of inbound SDRs. And the idea that I truly believe that you do not need that function um, unless you are using them as a way to um, take care of live chat and do other things like that. But if you if you strip away low intent leads for SDRs and you send high intent leads to directly to account executives, then you wouldn't need that team or most likely it would become an outbound team. Um, and so again, I don't I don't have a ton of uh, a ton of guidance on SDRs because that's how I if I was in charge and that's when I was at companies, that's what I would do. I wouldn't send inbound leads to SDRs. They would go directly to account executives and we weren't generating low intent leads. So I didn't have a lot of uh, alignment problems. They were always out pure outbound SDRs. A lot depends on the size of the company too, right? Like mm -hmm. what, what size, what size deals, you know, cause yeah, you can automate follow-up, but if it's a, you know, much bigger deal, it might be harder. Honestly, probably most of the time, that was a great answer, by the way. Um, I think most of the time it's rooted in like just the fundamental sales and marketing have a hard time working together when they feel like they have competing, like the, the reason they don't work is because marketing is like, you're not, you're not following up with the leads. You're not booking meetings for me. And then sales is like, well, we own the SDRs. And it's like, marketers don't like that because we feel like we don't own the outcome, but that's our goal. Like we're measured on pipeline but if we feel like the reps aren't booking meetings and like whose fault is that and so i think a lot of it comes down to alignment um mm -hmm. i would love the idea of just owning if, if i was using them to book meetings i would say i would make the case in marketing to own them and then we can just own more of the funnel and the the role of of aes and sales becomes success as you get on the phone and have lots of conversations we'll do the rest mm -hmm. and one anecdote that i've found as i've done this a couple times is that salespeople are very smart people and they're going to take the path of least resistance to hitting their goals. And if you as a marketer provide them with the, with the most clear, direct path, and they have confidence in that to get to their goals, whether it's a meeting booked or whether it's a pipeline or a revenue target, if you give them that, then they're going to take it. And so I felt that as a marketer, when I made that shift and the transition point is hard, right? Like I've inherit, I've come in as a marketing person and inherited a place where the company would send 30,000 garbage MQLs to the sales team. That sales team doesn't like to follow up with marketing leads. 
And then you start sending them 100 good leads after that. And it takes a little while for them to recognize, oh, things are different now. These people actually want to talk to us. These people actually convert. And if you can get over that hump, then, they, then the perspective is, is done. But I think the number one thing that creates misalignment is sending shitty leads to your SDR or sales team. Somebody once, it was at like a new hire presentation. Somebody asked me like, hey, what's, how do you explain the value of marketing? And I said, well, how many people here come from, come from a place where you used to have to do outbound? And like four people raised their hands. And, and I was like, well, at here, your life is going to be better, <laughs> right? Because like you're, you have high intent inbound meetings showing up mm -hmm. on your calendar. There's a little, there's a question from Simon here. Are we saying outbound sales is dying? I don't think that outbound sales is dying. I think that it needs to change a little bit. And I also think that marketing, when, in, when a company is operating marketing well, it creates a whole different type of outbound sales, a lot more targeted, a lot less short-term focused. I think that sales can do a little bit of a different thing when marketing starts to relieve that pressure. Yeah. And, and by the way, like there, a great combination is strong brand and outbound. Totally. Right? Because like then you're, you know, outbound sucks when you're going to knock on people's doors and you're like, hi, my name is, you know, Angelica and I'm from some software company you've never heard of. Like that's fucking hard. <laughs> but like, do you think it's hard doing marketing for Zoom right now? No. And so like, you know, if, if you have a strong brand that has your back and gives you air cover, it's, it's a little bit different when you're reaching out. It's also why like maybe the outbound, it's not that outbound sales is dead, but like what the, what the outreach is and the goal of outreach, like what mm -hmm. if you were reaching out for with a content offer first, right? Which is like, I'm going outbound to target accounts to try to get them on this Zoom call with Obama mm -hmm. instead of outbound to meeting is very challenging. Okay, now we got them and they, they did something. They came to one of our events. Okay, next step is going to be this. I think that's a that's a more modern way to me to use outbound. Mm -hmm. Love that. Let's try and get two more in. Nice. Okay. Um, from Tan Ward, for a two-person marketing team, what are the top activities to generate high intent leads? Mm. You go first on this one. Um. It depend. It depends on the company. <laughs> depends on the industry. Do you want to? Do you want to share? Can you get the industry or no? Um, can. can what's the industry? Put it. Put it in chat. Employee, Employee health, health, and health and safety. Okay. So I think like something like this. The the best way early on to so, so number one would be like straight up, get a demo on your website. Like mm -hmm. of course you got to have a way for people to contact you and book a demo or whatever. But in between there, my favorite type of um, uh, thing would be something like HubSpot has website grader, where you create this like great marketing assessment quiz. It's it's a lead magnet, but it's actually valuable. And so like if, if I was Tan, Tan Ward, like and I'm working in employee health and safety, my very first thing would be like, all right, we're going to spend the next 30 days or whatever. We're going to come up with this amazing like mini site landing page that's like the employee health health and safety assessment. Okay, whatever it is. And I'm going to start by creating content around that. I'm going to actually launch it as a mini product, like a grader. And then I'm going to actually do outbound and I'm going to send, I'm going to focus on email, one to one email, trying to get people to go through that to get that funnel going. Like to me, it's always, it's always some type of content asset that is going to drive you the most high intent because unless people have never heard of you, most people haven't heard of you before. And so if you just have a demo button on your website, you probably don't have enough traffic for that to be significant. So I think you need to go out and like, create the bait almost that you want that your ideal customer to go through and then be the person that has the solution to the problem that you help them identify. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My, my answer is pretty similar. I think the number you got to focus on your website because no matter what people are going to funnel back through that. Right. And so the, the messaging and the conversion path, I think are the, the easiest win, not that people are going to magically a million people are going to show up and convert. Right. But I think that's a foundational asset that you need. And the next couple of things like, one-to-one -one email to drive people back, I think is a short-term way that you might be able to get one or two as you get started. And I'll offer a couple of other ideas that I think are a little bit more short-term, um, which could be focusing on some type of co-marketing. So perhaps that there is a, whether it's a partner company that's non, or, or not necessarily a partner, but another, a parallel company that's non-competitive that already has an audience, see if you can get a spot on one of their webinars or see if you can get a spot somehow with them to let, they've already built the audience, see if you can get somehow get involved in that. But you have to think about what is valuable to them. What can you do for them, for them to do that for you? So that's one idea. 
And the, the next one would be going straight to podcast to LinkedIn with experts in employee health and safety. You can go and find, there's people out there that t- the easiest way that I do is I look, you have to look back a couple of years, conference haven't happened, but you can look at virtual events. Look at the conferences that your customers go to. Look at the people that speak at the conferences, reach out to them and see if they want to either do a virtual event, a podcast or something like that, and then chop it up for LinkedIn. LinkedIn stuff can happen pretty quickly. It really, it really can, but it, it's, it's rooted in long-term mindset and, and quality information. Cool. Talk to everybody on your website too, right? You mentioned website. Oh, yeah. I'd be like, if nobody knows you, who are the 17 people on my website right now? Nobody rolls out of bed and is like, I'm going to go shopping for B2B marketing, you know, B2B whatever. So <laughs> cool. One more Angelica. Let's do it. Okay, cool. As a one man band in a brand new marketing department, where do you recommend energy be focused first? It's sort of the same question. Could we do one more? Sure. The short answer is revenue. Go figure out what customers close and go do more of the things mm-hmm. that got them to close. Mm-hmm. Um, tips for getting more employees, especially execs and sales team on board with posting organic content on LinkedIn. Yeah, don't, don't try to get the whole company. My advice is like, don't try to get the whole company to do it. When it's force fun, it, nobody wants to do it and everybody hates it. Instead, find the like one or two people outside of the, fa- well, number one, it should be the, founder, co-founder, whoever, then there's always like one or two early employees, even an engineer or a product manager who just like love the company and are so proud of what they're building. Like marketing is contagious in the way that if you give people something good to share, they're going to do it because people love being on LinkedIn, being like, my company's awesome. Check me out. And so like, it, I wouldn't make it a company mandated thing, but I'd be like, my homework would be like, all right, who are the employees that are kind of already on social media, already on Twitter? or LinkedIn. And then could I ask them, Hey, we're doing a product launch, like have an event or, or ask them to start sharing content and, and ask them to, to do it in their own voice. Don't, don't try to be all marketing police on this and like, let them write it in their words and see how that goes and start to just I- extend the, extend the brand through the people that are already there and passionate about the company. Mm-hmm. Similar answer here. I think about it almost like a, a Trojan horse, so to speak. You need somebody in the company to pave the way. And it can be multiple people. But somebody needs to be able to show other co- people in the company the way. And the other people need to see what good looks like. Right? And so I think that's the start. And then people get a little bit more excited when they start to see other people have success. And they might want to get involved in success. And then someone else knows what to, to show them how to do it. And the other thing that we've tried that actually has been quite successful here is we've been introducing gamification into this type of thing. And so if people, like we did a contest in like last November, it was like whoever had, uh, who, whichever employee outside of like executives had produced um, the most LinkedIn posts in the, in the month of November that were quality content and the quality was just like, it wasn't a single line that wasn't helpful. So they made posts, whoever made the most during that month got a prize. And so, and then there was a little bit of a competition, a little bit of team building, the other people got involved and one person ended up winning. And that habit that was created during that time. And I think, I think the prize was like 250 bucks. So nothing for a company. And we, now we have like eight or 10 people that are excited to do it like multiple times a week. Yeah. And, and, and they had you as a role model, right? Like it starts Mm -hmm. with you can't, you can't get the whole company on social media if you don't have anybody that has a clue of how to use it. And so like, I would start with who's, who's, who's our role, who's, who's doing this. And so like for me at Drift, I had uh, David Cancel and Elias, the two founders, they were already on Twitter and already active on Twitter. So it was like, great, let's, let's beef it up for them. I'm, I got a loud mouth on Twitter. Like, I, you know, I can be a part of this too. And then you get other people, but you got to start with like, if you just, if you just go back to the company and you're the marketing leader and you've tweeted six times in your life and you're like, all right, team today, we're going to get on social media. It's gonna be like, mm, for, I'm going to listen to you. Like it's got, somebody's got to be able to lead by example. Mm-hmm. Dave. Thank you, man. This was uh, a long time coming. I enjoyed it a lot. Maybe we'll even do it again sometime soon. Who knows? But uh, and thank you for everyone we had. I think at the peak, we were close to 300 attendees, which is incredible. Blew our previous numbers out of the water. Thank you for for Dave for bringing some of uh, some of your peeps as well. You just make sure you round up for marketing persons. Over th- more than 300 met, more than 300 live. <laughs> make on sure of that. At the- <laughs> we'll put that in the show notes. So 
Um, everyone, thank, thank you very much for attending. Hope this was helpful. If there was questions that came through that we weren't able to answer, maybe I'll share those with Dave or him and I will, we'll figure out a way if we can to answer them or we'll just cover them on demand gen live future, future weeks. So, um, again, appreciate you and hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks, Dave.